Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series. My name is Alex and I am rated around 2000 ELO classically and therefore I'm aiming for at least 2000 ELO on my chess.com rapid. We're going to play the Cairo Khan just so I the game doesn't abandon me while I'm doing my intro. And um, basically in this series we just play rapid chess games on chess.com obviously. I talk you through my thought process while we play and then in the post game analysis which obviously comes after the game in the game review i'll like delve deeper into some ideas flesh out some lines to make it easier for you guys to visualize what i'm talking about while i'm playing and obviously the computer analysis can help to get a deeper understanding of the position with that being said, let's get into the game. We have a Karo Khan with knight to f3 on the second move. I mean, knight f3 is a main move, d4 is a main move, knight c3 is a main move. We're going to play d5, which is, you know, obviously principled. And my opponent goes for the two knights. Two knights attack. What do I... I don't see this a whole lot, to be honest. Now what I used to do against this was take, take, knight to f6, take, take. But I've been straying away from that line recently to go more in favour of takes, takes, knight d7, then knight f6. So after knight takes I don't have to take back with the pawn, but I can take back with my knight to keep my pawn structure intact. I believe bishop g4 is the main line here. And I don't want to go into the main line. And this is the way that I see lots and lots of chess openings, personally. I don't like going into the main line of things, because my opponent knows it. And if I enter the main line, I'm not playing another human. I'm just playing a robot at that point, because they've learned from computer analysis what the best moves are in the main line. So if I can take them out of theory, then we don't have that problem. So I want to go knight d7. And I'm expecting him to go queen 2 e2, so that knight f6 would blunder checkmate with knight d6. Common tactic. We're going to play knight d7, and if he goes queen e2, we're going to play e6, so that our bishop covers the d6 square, and then we can prepare the move knight f6 to challenge this knight in the center. Don't worry, if that didn't make sense, again, it will be covered in the post-game analysis. Uh, there is a playlist linked below, by the way with all the previous episodes of the rating climb so feel free to check those out if you want obviously you can just watch this video in isolation if you prefer because regardless I hope you're going to be able to earn, earn learn a lot so bishop c4 makes sense just targets e6 if I go knight to f6 now he might be preparing knight to g5 in like an alien gambit style which I do have a video of the channel where I uh, I kind of like refute it through not playing into it because the alien gambit only really works if you play h6 once the knight arrives on g5 so after the knight sacrifices itself the h7 pawn no longer defends the g6 square which makes defending the light squares in your position very difficult all the same, I think this move makes a whole lot of sense. These lines can get kind of tricky when um, white develops his bishop out to c4 in Karo Khan lines after the pawns get traded on e4. Because a lot of the time, e6, especially with a knight on d7, isn't all that stable. So here my opponent is threatening knight to d there, knight d6 checkmate because the queen is pinning the pawn to my king. So the move e6 makes a lot of sense to me. Because we also blunt this bishop, and our bishop now covers d6, so this isn't a move, and if he takes the knight, we still take back with the knight. e6 I also like, because it allows us to move this knight to b6 to attack this bishop, and means our queen now defends the knight. So after takes, we still don't have to take back with a pawn, we can take back with the queen to maintain a good pawn structure. So, e6 looks good. The, the only problem here is that white might try some tactics on the e6 square. 
uh, like sacrificing on e6, playing, I don't know, like knight g5, trying to go for like knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes. But as long as we always watch out for that, on every single move we play, we calculate what if white sacrifices. As long as we check that, we should be good. We can also try and put a knight on d5 potentially, just to block off this diagonal, which should make it quite safe. And we could rotate this knight through b6 with an attack on the bishop. So something like knight b6, bishop b3, and knight to d5. So yeah, our opponent goes knight g5, which is kind of expected. If we take the knight... He can't play queen takes because his knight hangs. So if knight takes, then knight takes. Then can we just go knight to f6? Knight back to g5 though. Knight to d5. d4. Defending the knight. It's an okay position. We can maybe play bishop e7. Mm, don't know how much I love that. I think knight b6 is quite tempting. Again, I've got to check for sacrifices. Uh, I'm a bit worried about knight b6, knight f7, king f7, knight g5. I don't really like that. If knight e4, knight f7, king f7, queen e4, then we have knight f6 and we're good. So let's take. Don't think I'm blundering anything. Again, he can't take with the queen because his knight hangs. So knight takes looks to be the only move to me. And then, yeah, we could just play a move like bishop e7. Like, I want to challenge this knight with the move knight to f6, but I'm worried about knight g5. But then maybe we can just play h6. And after... And if he tries to go for a sacrifice, I think we're good. I think we've got plenty of defense because this bishop would now protect e6. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Again, he doesn't have to take us, though. Because his knight is defended by his queen after all. But I might be trying to play the move queen d4. Don't know. Okay. d3. So I think we're out of the woods in terms of getting attacked now. I don't think there's any threats that white can realistically make. Because e6 is very well defended. And we've traded off one pair of knights. And we could trade off the second. But... If I take, I feel like he's going to take with the d-pawn, and then we have a symmetrical structure, which makes it difficult for us to create any winning chances, because I'd like to try and win. So bishop e7 looks good. Just developing the bishop. We can take any time, realistically. We could also play knight to d5, but I don't know if that accomplishes anything. This bishop is kind of a problem. I would like to play something like a6, b5, c5, bishop b7. But I feel like I should castle first. So let's castle. Again, I don't think there's any threats on me. I think I'm all good. Once we can figure out where to put this bishop, we should be fine. It's, I mean, it's a very solid position. Like, this is what the Karo Khan gets you. Like, yeah, we had to watch out for a couple of tactics in the opening. But now we just have a very easy position. C5, I really want to play now. To stop D4. Because now he's played C3. He's weakened the D3 square and he's trying to play D4. And C5 also kind of helps to prepare the idea of A6, B5, Bishop B7. C5 is a typical Cairo Khan move anyway. When you have pawns on C6 and E6, typically one of them will push up, normally to challenge a pawn on D4. But if we can just stop a pawn from going to D4 or discourage it, that also 
looks pretty good to me. So let's play c5. I think that's a very principled move. Just taking space in the center. Like this pawn was controlling these squares, but we already have a massive grip over d5, and b5 isn't really a big deal because we're going to play a6 to control b5 and then play b5 ourselves to open this bishop up on the long diagonal, which could potentially give us some attacking chances on the diagonal. I think that has happened in a previous um, episode of the Rating Climb, by the way. Like, I think the video title was like, was, uh, like Brilliant Tactics in the Cairo Khan or something. Something along those lines. It was a similar position anyway. Okay, a6, b5, and by the way, um, sorry, tangent, but like this is kind of how you develop these ideas in openings, just by playing them and watching people play them. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh yeah, I've developed my bishop to the b7 square before in the Cairo to create attacking chances on the king side. Like, this is a thing I've done before, so I know it's a viable strategy. a6 looks pretty logical he could play a4 but then we can just go b6 and develop the bishop all the same and i think the inclusion of a6 and a4 is good for us rather than just going b6 immediately because here we have control over the b5 square i mean he will as well if he plays a4 but i feel like it's good for us just because the a7 pawn isn't really doing anything. And also we stop a bishop ever coming there. I don't know whether it would, but... Eh, I feel like it can't hurt to include a6, a4. So... Yeah. It, it's probably just like the same regardless. So he's going to allow us to play b5, which seems like an odd choice. I think it's kind of a no-brainer because now that comes with tempo. I mean, his idea is d4, but we could even play c4. Yep, let's continue. By the way, this is a classic relationship between the bishop and the knight, where all of the knight's forward movement is monitored by my bishop. This is when there is two squares between, like, like vertically or horizontally, when there's two squares between a bishop and the knight. The bishop kind of dominates the knight's movement towards the bishop, if you get what I mean. It's a common, like, geometric idea in chess. And it's always something to watch out for. So I know this knight isn't really scary. Because it can't do anything without my bishop monitoring it coming forward, right? Here I quite like our position. If white, if white plays a move like a4... Then I'll probably play queen b6. And we're even threatening ideas. Mm. I was saying we might be threatening ideas of like c4 to try and undermine this knight. Like and overload this pawn. But white can always take on f6 with check. And gets out of the woods. But if we can force him to take us and then we get bishop takes. I think our bishops like on the long diagonals are very very strong. Compared to his bishop who's staring at a pawn chain and this bishop that's staring at nothing. So moves like queen b6, rook d8, rook c8, very natural moves. And don't get me wrong, like, we're not winning or anything. It's, it's probably about equal, but probably not even that much better. We do have more space on the queen side than he does. Like, we have pawns on our fourth rank. He has no pawns on his fourth rank, so maybe we have a slight advantage, especially with how strong this bishop is. But this is the nature of the Cairo Khan. Like, it's not incredibly confrontational. It's just very easy. You can avoid, like, 20 moves of theory, which is something that happens in openings like the Italian and the Royal Lopez and the Sicilian and the French. All of those are incredibly theoretical. Whereas here, it's not so much. Okay, so he takes. Take back with the bishop, obviously. 
And we do have to watch out for ideas of bishop e6, pawn e6, queen e6 with check at some point, but yeah, we're fine. And this was the move I was expecting, to be fair. And if we take, then his queen gets incredibly active. So I would rather he take us so we can take back. At the same time, it's kind of difficult to improve our position with this tension remaining because I would like to play moves like queen b6, but then he ruins our pawn structure. And like I said, I don't want to take him because then it centralizes his queen and he's doing quite well. So we could play queen e7 to play a move like rook to d8, but I don't know if I love that. We could play rook c8 here. I think that's kind of a low risk improving move. Not really committing anything. And we're giving him the option to take us. Bishop to d5 is a move. But I think I'd rather keep these bishops on the board. Because mine, I believe, is better than his. Because we're staring at a weak pawn. And e6 isn't that weak. As long as no bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes tactics exist. Then we're good. So let's play rook c8. If he pushes, we might push. So uh, it's an option. We could, um, if he pushes, just take as well, though. D4 looks like a very natural move here. We could play. Okay, he takes us. So that I think that's good for us. Because now our, our, our queen's fairly active. If the queen steps onto the g-file, we're going to be threatening mate, so it's worth keeping an eye out on. It also frees up the d8 square for a rook to go to. So, okay. If c4, this bishop does get onto this diagonal. But c4, bishop here. If we play queen g5, he can just go bishop to e4. So, my proposal is... What if we play queen g6? And once he defends the g2 pawn with a move like f3, then we've forced him to weaken his position because he doesn't have this inclusion yet. However, queen g6, can he play d5? Because it blocks our bishop's attack off. And if we take, then everything just gets traded. If queen g6, d5, c4, bishop, c2 comes to an attack on my queen. Queen g5. Do have major pressure on the pawn and it can't move because otherwise queen g2 is mate. But maybe f4 can boot our queen. And then he can take on e6. So that's not perfect. Hmm. G6, D5. What if we play Rook D8? And if he takes... Queen G5? Threatens mate and... <clears throat> attack c5. So rook d8 check, rook d8. f3. Queen c5 check. King h1. That looks good. We control the d file. Our bishop is still strong. And we induce f3, which looks quite weakening. Hmm. What about if we take? If we take... Then rook take. Oh my god. If we take, then rook takes. I don't think we gain anything. If we go c4, bishop c2. Queen g5, bishop e4, like we already calculated. I don't like that. So rook d8. What about if we move this rook to d8? No, that doesn't make sense. 
the only reason I considered rook c d8 is so that rook takes d8 does not come with check, which it does if the f rook moves. I'm just considering rook takes, but after rook takes, queen takes, rook d1, queen g5, f3. I don't think we gain anything. So queen g5 immediately. Threatening mate on g2. Also attacking c5. I'm expecting takes takes. Because it comes with check. And it's we're going to have a 2v3 on the queen side. And a 4v3 on the king side. I don't know who that favours. Typically, the majority on the queen side is favourable to have. So, white should be in a better position because he has the queen side majority. The king side majority is less of a deal because the king's already there. So, even if we force a pawn through, it's difficult to get it past his king. But on the queen side, like our king has a massive journey to travel to try and stop the pawn. If he, you know, gets a pass pawn on the A file, for example, our king's got an absolute mile to travel. So end games may favour him, but that's only if we trade everything. I think for now, we may have a slight advantage because of our bishop. Our bishop is better than his bishop. I would argue my queen is slightly better than his queen, just because our queen is more central. And if we can dominate the d-file, then maybe we have an argument for an advantage. But I also don't see how we stop everything getting traded. He's taking a bit of a think here, which is always good to see. Because there's always ways that, you can, that your opponent can panic and go wrong, even if a position looks fairly like simple or a move looks fairly obvious. Sometimes you can just overthink it or see a ghost or something. You don't know unless you actually ask the question. And yeah, this seems like an odd move. F4. So, okay, the point is our queen is under attack, yeah? And his queen defends the g2 square, so this is no longer mate. But now we can just play queen c5 with check, which I think is a no-brainer. And yeah, he can do that, but now g2 is a permanent weakness, because the pawn, I think, belongs on f3 to try and blunt this bishop forever. So now, queen to c6 looks very strong. Because we just maintain this battery, which is currently tying down his queen. He might be trying to play f5. Then we can maybe even take, because again, his queen can't take because this is mate. We can also push, like, if we wanted to, and create a passed pawn. But, you know. I guess he's just trying to use his bishop in conjunction with the move f5 to try and break apart our king side. And put pressure on f7 once the f file opens. But he might struggle to do that. Now, he might go queen g3 to maintain the defense. Why does that look wrong? I don't know. It looks wrong. I, I don't know why, though. Here, here. Also here, just here. Um, why does that look wrong? If we take and queen takes, we don't have rook d8. Hmm, maybe it is a good move. Trying to double up. Ah, 
I'm trying to find some way to get an advantage here. Don't know whether it exists though, because if we give him another move, he's going to play Rook uh, after d1. So I think we have to take to stop him from doing that. This looks nice to me though. Because if he moves his king, then the d8 square is defended by my, by my queen and we can play rook d8 with tempo and try and dominate the d-file. But not only does his bishop defend d1, which makes contesting the d-file easier for him, but he can play queen f2. But if he goes queen f2, we could potentially take. And if takes, play rook d8. we do this, he's going to do the, this. Like, if we avoid the queen trade, he's just going to take the d-file for himself. So I think we need to trade queens here. Yeah, king takes. Here, he's just going to go here. This is probably a draw. We also have a lot of pawns on light squares, which makes them vulnerable. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play king f8. I'm actually going to give him the d-file for now. I'm going to let him play rook d1, and I'm going to play king to e7 to cut off the rook's entry squares. He's putting pawns on dark squares, which is smart. Makes it difficult for us to do anything. Rook c5 looks nice. Trying to swing to h5 to maybe induce some weaknesses, especially because our bishop's cutting off some of the squares the king would like to go to. You could also try like h5, h4. But if h5, then he goes h4. Don't know how I'll feel about that. Let's play rook c5. Again, his rook can't infiltrate on like any good square in our territory. We're also controlling the move c4. Could try a4. Ooh. Now, if we go rook h5, he could just play rook d2. If we go eight pawn h5, pawn h4. G3 is weak, but it's hard to access. We could play e5. But I don't like giving up control of d5. a5 looks kind of nice to me. Could be trying to play king to d4. f6. g5. We go h6 g5. Okay, I like that idea. Just trying to create some kind of imbalance. Because we have a majority on the king side, and if this king strays further away from the king side, we might have some chances. Maybe. Big maybe. But we've got to try. We do we, we do have low time, but the position isn't all that complicated, so it shouldn't be too difficult to not flag. Especially because we get an extra 10 seconds after every move. Like, that's pretty damn helpful. Especially for me, because if you've been around the channel, you know I'm very slow sometimes. Especially when I'm trying to explain myself, right? Uh, by the way, if you've made it this far in the video, and you're not already su subscribed, what are you doing? You just spent half an hour listening to me chat utter wham about chess. So you should probably drop a subscribe if you're finding it educational or um, entertaining. I'd really appreciate that. I mean, you don't have to, obviously, but if you've watched half an hour, you're probably enjoying the content and you might want to get notified when the next episode drops. Spoiler alert, that is every single day. So, I mean, you don't really need notifications on because you already know it's coming every single day. But you could. You could. This was a really weak ask. That was a very weak, <laughs> weak ask for a subscription. But, hey, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, yeah, A4, that's a, 
an, a move that you would expect. A move you would expect. Now, if I take bishop takes. Rook C for oh no he he can infiltrate on D7 if I take so that's bad. We could play this, but if he takes we just take back with the pawn and I think we're okay. It does open the A file though. If he takes well we could actually take back with the rook and win B2. So he can't actually take us right now. So I say we go with G5. Is this a problem? I don't think so. If he goes king d4, we might actually be able to play king d6. Okay, he goes bishop c2. It does give us this square though. Go there now. Take, take. I, I, that just doesn't look right to me. Bishop c2. Rook c4. I'm going to play rook c4. It could be a bad move, but... Worst case scenario, we just return to c5. I feel like I want to throw this in. Let's do it. Just so we can't take with the king. Let's take. Bishop d3, rook back to c5. Because this also doesn't work in this position. Like, I mean, I would love to play that, but I can't. So let's just defend our pawn. We could play bishop c6 to help defend the pawn. We might have created a couple weaknesses here with our g5 push. You can argue b5 is a weakness, but it's difficult for him to attack it with his rook. He might be wanting to play this. But... So, like, try and come in on these squares. If he goes rook to a1... Bishop d4... Five rook a five. So rook a one bishop c six. If he gives us a check, we just move up. Um, rook a one bishop c six. If he goes to a five, then we're defended. Like b five is well defended. That's unexpected. Can we decline the trade? Takes, takes, check. That's good for him. His king's getting very active. That's a good move. Hmm. Tempted to drop the bishop back, but then his bishop is very strong. I think we have to take. Not a fan, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna play check. Now if he goes here, he's mated. So he has to retreat. Yep. There is a chance he could have fallen for that. Um B5. Rook here. No. go f6. This should just be a draw. Should be a draw. But I I don't think I've really had a chance to actually push for a win, to be honest. I, I feel like I tried, but at a, a certain point, pushing for a win is really just pushing for a loss. 
yeah, we can't trade rooks here. So we just retreat. If we trade rooks, then his king is too active. He wins this pawn and the game is over. So we can't do that. We drop the rook back. We control our weak b5 pawn. The king also can't really do a whole lot. We can also maybe come to h5 to threaten h2 to try and get his rook to become passive. We could try and go for e5, which, I mean, we might do under the right circumstances. Maybe that's, maybe that gives us some winning opportunities. But again, we don't want to push too hard. But playing e5 shouldn't be bad. Especially, like I said, if we can get this rook to go passive with something like rook d2 to defend the h2 pawn. Then maybe we're on to something small admittedly small like we're not onto anything amazing but it's could be something i don't want to allow this king to run towards this pawn though because that could become a problem that could become a problem because his king is more active than our king which is something we have to keep in mind in this position but okay i mean i i, I don't think he has any real way through he has a 2 on 1 on the queen side, we have a 2 on 1 in the center. Arguably, the queen side majority is better, but hey ho. Okay, king moves. Wait. Aren't we winning h2? Because he just blocked off his own rook's escape. Is this his plan? To try and create a passed b pawn? Like, c4 takes. King takes rook h2 b4. That looks very risky. Because if the rooks and the pawns get traded, we're going to be left with a two on one. If he goes here, could we push? But then c5 takes takes. We still, he still has to pass B pawn. If here we could deliver this check first, though, so he his king can't maintain defense of the pawn. If the king steps onto the second rank, this comes with check and the game is over. So if C4 rook H3, the king would have to come up to E4. But then we have F5 check, king E5, and rook E4 with checkmate. So c4, c4 loses. C4 loses to rook h3. Oh my god. C4 is his resource though, because if um, if c4 and we take, then king takes and he has a passed pawn. But if c4 rook h3 check first, we force the king onto the second rank because I just explained what happens if the king advances, and then we take here with check. And that changes everything. So c4. c4, rook h3, king c2 looks like the most logical move. Take with check. King c3. Take. Rook takes. We have extra time there. Because this pawn is still back. Yeah, rook h3. He must have missed this. He must have missed this. Please walk into checkmate. Oh my god, no. 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 <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> there was a completely drawn rook end game. That was completely drawn. Bro. Bro. This is going to be a sick analysis. That's actually mad. Oh my god. This is what I'm saying though. Like, even though it's a drawn end game, you just keep pushing. Your opponent can make a mistake. And I mean, that's a major mistake. And I literally predicted it as well. Oh my god. Let's get into the analysis, boys. Okay. I literally got 96.7% accuracy that game. I made three inaccuracies all game. No mistakes, no misses, no blunders. 
And my opponent had 90.7, so like 90.7 accuracy. And he only made two inaccuracies, no mistakes, no misses, but one blunder, which I assume was um, like at the end. That's mad. Like that was an incredibly high level game. And it's not like we were playing forcing lines in the opening or anything. Like it was just very, very accurate. And I mean, admittedly, the Karo Khan can lead to these fairly, eh, fairly simplistic positions where the moves are kind of easy to spot. There's not loads of tactical complications, but it's definitely stuff you have to watch out for. So we have e4, c6, knight f3, d5. White can take here. This is an idea, and then go d4. But this is slightly inaccurate because this, like Karo Khan exchange variation, normally the knight doesn't go to f3. Because you can come into some problems if um, like a bishop comes to g4 potentially. Because it's difficult to break this pin. Sort of. Like normally the knight goes to e2. Because then the pin is easy to stop. But to be fair, white can just play moves like c3, queen c2, knight 2, d2. To like support this knight. But then often this bishop reroutes to a square like g6 to trade itself off for this bishop. But again, that's not what our opponent chose. He chose the two knights. Knight f6 is a move here. I did consider this. After e5, you can either play knight to e4. And if white trades, I don't think it's amazing for him. Knight g5, queen d5, queen e2. I guess this is just quite drawish. But this is a line. Or instead of advancing the knight to e4... You can play knight to d7 and try and play this in more of like a fret, like an advanced French style of like e6 and c5. I feel like I might have preferred this position to be honest. Maybe next time I'll play that. Again, this is the advantage of computer analysis because I now know after this position, I don't have to take. I can go for like knight f6, e5, knight d7 and get a structure that I'm quite comfortable with. Because the Karo often transposes into French-like positions. But d takes e4 is fine, obviously. Knight e4. Knight f6 is a move here. But after knight takes, pawn takes, I don't really like the damaging of the pawn structure. And I feel like white has a very easy game here. Because the classic setup is something like this. Um... Oh, maybe a different move move order, like castle first, rook e8, c3. Queen's coming to c2. It's very, very easy to play for the white side. And I feel like I never get anything out of these positions as black. It's just like a dead draw most of the time. So I instead go for knight to d7. And after bishop c4, knight gf6. Queen e2. If I play a move like, I don't know, b5, then knight d6 is mate because the king, the, the, the pawn is being pinned to the king by the queen and the knight attacks the king and the king has no squares. It's just like a classic smothered mate. So I play e6 so that my bishop defends this square. I'm sure I could have taken. To be fair, I don't really know why I didn't. I think I thought the moves were kind of interchangeable. You do have these like classic knight to e5 move, and if you take the queen, bishop f7 is mate because the knight covers the only escape square for the king. But obviously after knight e5, you can just play e6, stop all these ideas, queen retreats, and then, I don't know, moves like bishop d6 look pretty natural. But I chose e6 immediately, knight fg5, and yeah, here we can just take. And the point is you can't take with the queen because your knight hangs because the d pawn hasn't moved yet so the bishop doesn't defend the g5 square again worth watching out for because normally the bishop does defend g5 but if the d pawn hasn't moved then it doesn't so we take knight takes is forced we go knight f6 apparently it's an inaccuracy apparently bishop e7 is better but i played knight f6 because i liked the fact that my bishop now controlled e6 because again this um like placement of the white pieces can sometimes be scary against e6 
And with a knight on d7 blocking my own bishop's defense, it can sometimes lead to some very devastating tactics. So just for peace of mind, so I don't have to calculate absolutely everything, I just whack the knight on f6, offer a trade, and open up my bishop's defense. So I'm never really bothered by any tactics. So, d3, bishop e7, castle, castle, c3. And yeah, here we play c5, which is the best move. And I wanted to wait until he played c3 to play c5, because c3 commits to the move d4. Because otherwise a d3 pawn is just a bit stupid, especially with the open d file. If we can get too much control over the d4 square, then d3 will be a permanent weakness. So white immediately goes... Oh, no, he plays bishop to f4 first. We go a6. Again, a4 is a move, but I wasn't really worried. Apparently knight d5 is decent to attack this bishop. But I was planning just to go b6, bishop b7 here. And I thought that it doesn't really matter if uh, a4 is included, because either way I feel in Keto the bishop. Maybe I take a bit less space, but a5 is never really a move because we just push, right? So a6, rook ad1, b5, bishop retreats, and bishop b7. The, posi the position is dead equal, but of course we still have to try and play good moves and still pose questions. He takes on f6, which is a little bit inaccurate. We take bishop e5. I did like this move from my opponent. And like I said, I mentioned queen e7 as a move, which is the computer's favorite move, only by like a tiny, tiny margin. It still likes rook c8. You can take, but I didn't like this, because I felt like his queen was very like strong. Computer just says go queen e7, and everything is defended. Like, there's no problems, but why allow your opponent to have an active queen when you can just not? Which is why I went rook c8, because I want him to take me. And he does, which gives me, like, the tiniest of advantages. Because, like I explained, my bishop's a bit better than his bishop, my queen's a bit better than his queen. So we have a tiny advantage. But d4. And, yeah, I pick the best move here, which is rook fd8. Apparently b4 is also a move. You can take. But I didn't see anything for us in this line. Rook fd8, rook fd1. Yeah, everything's just getting traded. I kind of wanted to avoid mass trades, which is why after d4, yeah, I did consider the move queen g6. I did think d5 wasn't amazing, but apparently rook fe8. And I guess white can't do anything with the pawn because he's going to get mated. And if he goes bishop c2 play f5 okay i missed f5 if i'd seen f5 maybe i would have played it and gone into this line but i didn't see that besides he doesn't even have to play d5 in this position he can just play f3 and this diagonal is now blunted and now we're just gonna have to take and i didn't really like this so instead i played rook f2 d8 to contest the d file and after he takes we play queen g5 with the double attack and here I was expecting f3, queen takes c5, queen f2, and the game goes on. But he went f4. I thought this was a bit bad, but apparently it's just as good as f3. Take, queen f2, queen c6. Rook d2 I thought was a good move. Because the problem is, if we play a move like h6, then rook fd1. Takes, takes, and... The computer wants us to play queen e8 or queen c7 so that we can defend the d8 square to contest it. Again, white, I feel like, has a slight advantage here. Because if we play a move like queen c7, queen d4 stops queen d8. And if anyone's going to win this, it's white. It should be a draw, but if anyone wins, then white wins. So I took, I played a check. And my point was, if the king moves, then I'm going to play rook d8, and I have a tiny advantage, because I now have the d-file. My opponent also realized this, so he played queen f2. Kind of forces a trade. We could try and, like, repeat ideas with queen to c6, but I was a bit worried about moves like f5 and rook to d1. Because now I can't contest the d-file, right? Because the whole point of putting my queen on b6 was to defend the d8 square. Therefore, I took on f2. King f2. Now, if rook f2, 
then I was going to play rook d8. Because the rook can't come to d2 to contest me. And if the rook tries to go to f1 to come to d1. I mean rook d2, rook d1. I can take on g2 with check. So this is not mate. So that was my idea. I mean rook d2 apparently you can just go rook f2. And we're kind of just repeating moves at this point. Because d1 is not accessible. But it creates some chances right. Because I control the d file. And he can't contest me. But after king f2, if I go rook d8, then rook d1, and I can't do anything because I can't access the d2 square anymore because white gets there just in time. Which is why after king f2, I play king f8, which is the best move, because after rook d1, I can go king e7. I can control all the rook's infiltration squares, right? Why trade rooks when I can try and make his rook kind of useless with a king? A rook is going to be better than a king in this situation. So g3, rook c5. A lot of these moves are just zeros. As long as you don't mess up majorly, most moves are fine. King e3. g5 is, an, is the engine's favorite idea here. It does like going h6 first. a4. And yeah, I didn't want to take this. Because I felt like it only helped the white position because it weakens the A pawn for the rook to come over. And the C pawn is passed now. I mean, it's difficult for it to actually be pushed, but he does have a passed C pawn. So I went G5, which is the best move. I was expecting King D4 here to attack my rook. And I was going to play King D6. And even though it looks really scary to align the king with his rook like this, we control all of the king's advancing squares. Right, So the king can't move anywhere forward or sideways. So the only move that white has to open up a discovered attack is king e3. And then this is just the same position. The thing is, because of, the thing, because of what I was explaining with the queen side majority being stronger than the king side majority. Because my king is further away from the queen side than the king side. And same for him, right? And also because it's a smaller amount of pawns on the queen side, it should be not only easier for him to create a passed pawn on the queen side, because there's less pawns to trade off, but it's also harder for my king to defend against a queen side pawn trying to, to promote than his king defending against a king side pawn trying to promote, because his king is so close to the promotion squares on the king side, whereas my king isn't to the queen side, and is also currently cut off by his rook. So if anyone should be better, it should be my opponent. Which is probably why he didn't want to do this, because it's just repeating. And I'm also low on time, so he's got that going for him as well. So bishop c2 is not a great move. And I said after he played that, I don't think that's great. Now I did miss the idea of b4, playing on the fact that his pawn is pinned. After king d4, rook d5, king c4... Gf4. If you take here, then bishop d5, king v4, f3. Looks very good for me. And if you take back, then rook h5. This is some very complicated endgame stuff, to be honest, because this is 3v1 and it looks terrifying. But I guess the point is if you play a move like b5, let's pretend this bishop isn't hanging. Then after like takes takes, your pawns aren't that scary. But I guess you could take with the king. Again, let's forget this is hanging. But I think the computer prefers my passed pawn because my bishop not only monitors a1, but also monitors h1 on the long diagonal. And his bishop currently can't contest me. So I think that's the computer's logic. Again, let's forget the bishop's hanging, just for the sake of analysis. So... Yeah, apparently b4 was the best move. I could have also taken here. Ah, and he can't take with the king. Not because of rook c4, because then rook d4, but b4. I just missed this idea of b4 and the fact that the bishop is hanging. I, I knew in my head that bishop c2 wasn't correct, but it just doesn't look right. But I missed the idea of b4. Anyway, I go rook c4. Slightly worse for me after takes, takes, 
takes takes the reason i did this was so that he had to take with the pawn so i could split his structure and try and play on the fact that h2 could be weak in the future which is exactly what we did bishop d3 apparently rook a4 is good and if he takes rook e4 check and then we win the f4 pawn because this bishop steps off of the defense but i really don't want to give him two passed pawns on the queen side so rook c5 which is a better move anyway bishop e4 and yet the only move for us to maintain like a tiny advantage is to take which is what we did i didn't want to trade bishops because i wanted to keep winning chances in the game but practically speaking you have to take this because if you play a move like bishop c8 your bishop is so passive and his is so active now and although i could argue my rook is better than his rook my bishop is so much worse than his bishop again it's a dead draw because of course it is but i instead decide to take king takes okay rook h5 is a move here but after rook d2 i was like what do i do this rook h3 stops this pawn from ever moving and in this if this pawn can never move not only can the king not come back to help but this rook can never move Again, this is a complete draw. I went rook c4 again to try and keep some winning chances alive. King e3. The computer just wants me to go back to c5, but I went f6, which is also fine. Rook d4. Again, basically everything is drawing here. Then king d3. That was like, really? Rook h5. The only move here for him is to play rook 2b4 to attack my pawn. And if rook b4... Then if I take, then he takes. And it becomes a bit of a race now. <clears throat> and apparently it's just a draw. I guess because of rook h5 getting behind the pawn. But again, at least there's some winning chances. But yeah, here he went c4. Which is not great. And if you take, then king takes rook h2 b4. It's just a draw because this pawn is pretty quick. Like this pawn is quick, but so is this pawn. Realistically, the pawns are going to get traded. I don't know, like rook b2, b5, h5, rook d3, h4, rook h3, king d6, takes, rook c2, king b3, rook f2, it's a draw realistically and i mean this is only one line to get to a drawn position but in these kinds of end games like it's very difficult to actually get a win rook h3 i thought posed the most problems because it's so unnatural to step onto the second rank because if you do then i take on h2 with check and king c3 you take rook has to take because otherwise b2 hangs and then I feel like I am a bit better because not only am I up a pawn now, but also his pawn is a little bit slower than it was before. And if we just get into a pawn race here, what about this? Then we queen at the same time, but. He's just going to check me perpetually, to be honest, because he promotes first. Apparently, does you got to be careful with it, though. If I go to, like, f8. Queen, queen f2? Are you serious? What about if you just give a check? Apparently, I'm better, because I just hide behind my pawns. And yeah, I am up a pawn, and f4 is very weak. No one plays um, queen back to f2, by the way. That's ridiculous. So, okay, even in this position, I still have winning chances, because my king can actually get quite safe. But yeah, like I say, it's very unnatural to go back to the second rank, because then I take on h2 with a check. But king e4 just blunders mate. Which, I mean, I predicted, because if f5 isn't a move here, and you take on h2... Then, I mean, you, you still got problems, to be fair, because you can't defend the pawn. 
and like I'm up two pawns. It should just be a draw. But uh, it's very difficult. I feel like this is very, very losable for white. Very losable. But yeah, I mean, f5 exists. And then here, my opponent realizes his mistake and resigns because king e5, rook e3, rook e4, rook e4 is checkmate. And yeah, after playing, my opponent essentially played a perfect game. Like, we both played a perfect game. And at the, at the very, very end, he blunders. That's why you got to keep pushing, guys. And that takes us up to 1952 ELO. Only 48 points ELO off the goal. If you enjoyed the video, thank you very, very much. And if you've made it till the end, it's like over an hour. Like, that's mad. Um, actually, like, fair play to you. I hope you found it useful. And I'll see you in the next one.